This conference will now be recorded. There we go. Okay, can everybody see my uh, November 2020 boys rep meeting slide? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Great. Yes. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for joining me tonight for our November 2020 boys rep meeting. Um, the topics that we're going to cover tonight are going to include our staff introductions. Uh, we're going to go over our, our boys landing page, a uh, small change to it this year in terms of how to access it. Uh, we'll also go through rules for the season, uh, recruitment of officials, coach certification requirements and trainings that will be offered um, how to prepare for the scheduling meeting, determining playing levels, team evaluations, uh, team registration, and then uh, submitting age eligibility petitions. And we'll also cover a, um, a scattering of uh, other topics along the way. So I'd like to introduce, first of all, myself. I'm the NCJLA Boys Director. Um, we have uh, two fantastic commissioners <laughs> returning with us this year, we've got our uh, boys high school commissioner, Jim Kircher, which is, he is uh, on the call tonight. And we also have our boys uh, tenure commissioner, Raldo Gonzalez, who's returning this year as well. Okay. Okay, so uh, with that said, we are still looking for two new commissioners for our 12U and our 8U, 10U. Uh, the window to um, either apply for the positions or to reach out and try and get more information about the positions is still open. So uh, we're looking for some talented individuals to help us um, craft the league, help make important decisions with respect to you know rules and end of season events and uh, to help participate in um, basically building and growing the game throughout uh, Northern California. So if you or no, you know somebody who might be a fantastic candidate, uh, please send them our way. Okay, so uh, a small change that we made this year with respect to how to find the uh, boys landing page is we just consolidated on the left-hand side the, the boys and the girls uh, pages. And so you'll see here when you go to the menu on the left-hand side, uh, the two of them are together and then from there you just have the option to select the uh, boys director page and again that page gives you kind of the latest and greatest of what's happening with our one our webinars it also uh, provides you with links to previous webinars uh, that you can access typically within 48 hours of the completion of the webinar um, any other um, meetings that we have throughout the season regarding rules or uh, scheduling things like that um, we will often have the links there as well. Anything that's kind of the current events of, of what's happening uh, on the boys' side of the uh, league, uh, you can go there to find that information. Okay, so let's talk about some rules. Um, first of all, at this point, there's no rule changes for 2021. Um, as you can see here, the U.S. Lacrosse and NFHS 2020 rule books for both youth and high school levels will still be utilized until the end of the 2021 season. Um, U.S. Lacrosse will not be reviewing changes to the rules for the 20, uh, 2021 beyond edits to minor clarifications. I know NFHS had a couple small things with um, how things were stated and punctuation and things like that, but outside of that, uh, no fundamental rule changes. Um, we do want to uh, make everybody aware of that within the NCGLA, uh, we just we wanted to provide a, a clarification to the 10U uh, boys rule with respect to um, one offensive pass per offensive possession. So um, that was pretty easy to uh, to pass through and to clarify. And then um, one other significant thing that's a little different from last year is that high school seniors now they they can play on JV, uh, but it requires a petition. So we know that, um, especially this year, that um, maybe fielding teams is going to be difficult, at, um, especially at the high school level. So we wanted to, to try and make it a little bit easier. Uh, there still is a petition process, but you know, 
uh, no reasonable petition will be denied on that. So if you have a JV team and you got some senior, you know, you only have a couple of seniors in the mix, uh, please send that uh, petition in so we can get the kids playing. Now, that being said, um, one thing that uh, crossed our desks uh, recently was um, this uh, Virginia High School League um, memo that came out with respect to what they were doing or they're looking to potentially do this season to increase the likelihood of their boys taking the field. Um, so we wanted to, we got this information and we wanted to make you, uh, our delegates, aware of what, you know, other uh, organizations are doing and, you know, potentially we could take action on it or maybe not. You know, we want to make sure that um, the information is getting passed on to everybody so that you know we we can we can make the best possible decisions to try and get uh our our kids back on the field um currently the uh boys lacrosse is uh, ranked as a um a medium risk sport with respect to you know covid and um uh you know any type of um picking up of of covid from from play so um when you review these rules, a couple things that this organization is looking to try and do is reduce the those times of contact or at least close proximity. Um, a couple items in particular that they are proposing is to do away with the face-off. So um, there are a couple different ways that, you know that are looking to potentially handle the face-off, whether it's you know goal gets scored, ball starts with the goalie, or the uh, opposing team that uh, was scored on gets the ball at midfield. Now. Um, the other thing that the other significant rule here that we can pull out is uh, that they are rule they're ruling out any uh, body checking, so no no body checking at all, uh, only stick checking. So um, this discussion tonight, or at least me bringing this up tonight, is is not to thoroughly vet this idea out uh, because we could definitely get into the weeds, and especially as you look at the additional components that they've added to uh, the list. Um, you know we could get into each one of them separately and that would probably take the rest of the meeting um but what i i would like to do is one make everybody aware of it um now any type of rule that any type of change that we wanted to to put in place for the 2021 season we would definitely want to vet that out i've already engaged uh the commission division commissioners as well as the regional commissioners in this conversation throwing those uh this out there to gauge their feedback um, so this is a long way from actually happening with the NCJLA if it was something that we decided to do uh, as an organization to try and get us into a low risk sport category um, to try and get the, the kids on the field. Um, that's the intent behind this is to take it from a medium, medium risk to a low risk. In order to do that, we would have to one, make the changes and two, uh, provide uh, the governor's office with um, these parameters that have changed to try and qualify for a low risk sport. Uh, at this point in time, uh, Jim Kircher, I don't know if you wanna add any additional uh, commentary to this uh, specific item. Um, it's a relatively you know, new thing to come across our desk, so we haven't had a lot of time to vet it out. Yeah, this is uh, Jim Kircher, can you hear me all right, Chris? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I went through and looked at this and um, I also went and took a look at Virginia. They're already in presently using these rules for all of their tournament play because it dropped them into a low risk. So as opposed to here in California where we, we are not allowed to play any lacrosse at this point, even at tournament level, um, they're actually playing tournaments because they were able to use these uh, particular rules and they were able to get themselves into a safer category and they're playing lacrosse. I don't even care what kind it is. And that's probably the question you really need to ask yourself. Do you want your kids playing some form of lacrosse or no lacrosse? And, you know, what I'm looking at, and of course, like Chris says, it, this can get us to a lower risk area and it's still got to get accepted at a different level, a higher level. Um, and this can get our boys on the field. Then I'm all for it. I, I don't even care what it looks like. Um, the main reason I view that as an important in the go-between is it gets us on the green light and we get to start doing this. And if fingers crossed, you know, come late April, as Dr. Fauci was saying, everybody's got 
uh, their vaccines in place, we can probably roll back some of these and start playing regular lacrosse. But in between, we had kids on the field, we had kids practicing, uh, we got the opportunity to get our team scheduling games and kind of counting on games actually happening. Um, I also talked with um, Mike Forzano briefly about this and some interpretations on this as well. Jim, did we lose you? I think we may have uh, You guys still hear me? There you go. Yeah, I had, a, I had a phone call coming in. Uh, yeah, so just uh, just in talking with Mike Forzano, they're looking at these rule changes as a possibility as well. And just to put it into perspective, the C CIF right now uh, has December 12th as a go, no go for CIF football. And then uh for lacrosse they don't even have them starting up until march 15th and that's like centuries away for them as well so just so, take a look at these things maybe look at there's also some uh i went out to virginia and there's some discussion going on about this style of play but if you look at it overall they're on the field at least playing right now whereas we don't have any games going on. So I think in the big picture, you may want to look at that as well. I agree uh, with some of the, you know, not having face-offs and totally changes the game, but I'd rather have a game than no game. So that's pretty much my input at this point. And we're a long ways away from discussing these types of rule changes anyways. Take a look at it, educate yourself, get some uh, broader appeal and perspective if you can. Great. All right, thanks, Jim. Um, again, this deck will be also available on the um, Boys Landing page if you want to go through and uh, pull this uh, particular piece out to share with your programs. Okay. All right. So, you know, in, in the midst of trying to prepare for a season, you know, we it's in our best interest to kind of prepare different scenarios based on what we are allowed to play. Um, I think uh, what we were able to ascertain from meeting with our regional group, you know, our regional meetings was that the ideal scenario would be to go back and play, you know, your traditional standard full field games with uh, your, your full rosters and so on. Um, as, a, as a backup uh, to that, we're trying to figure out ways where, you know, if we're not allowed to do that, if we have to go small sided or if we have to, you know, we're, we realize that um, field space is going to be quite the commodity in the upcoming season because of all the different sports being compacted into you know, the same seasons or the same time frame. So we understand that teams are going to be struggling with numbers. Uh, we understand that uh, teams are going to be struggling with field space. So we're trying to figure out ahead of time different potential solutions um, to address those issues. So. Um, some items that have, have come out as obviously we've got the um, we got you know your standard your your regular season or we have cross field uh, options where we're taking a field and we're going uh, short sided games um, we are creating some uh, basic rule sheets for those to kind of get an idea of what it would look like um, there is most likely going to be um, the potential for some type of situation where if we can field full field teams, you can field a full field team. You may be able to play games against other full field, you know, uh, teams. But then there may be clubs that are struggling with numbers, and they may ask that you do, you know, uh, either seven v seven or you know, short sided games. So it sounds like from the feedback from the regional meetings uh, that flexibility is going to be key. Uh, that everybody's buying into that. Uh, um, however, we are going to have to deal with the the realities of uh, setting up a game on a weekend. You know, uh, we can't just necessarily show up to that game and then um, be all that flexible simply because of you know scheduling officials and managing time on the field. So, um, you know, we're trying to come up with different solutions accordingly. So, um, another item that has come out of our our discussions is one we have the standard runtime rules which you're all familiar with on the um, scheduling appendix but then other programs have said you know well, what about if we're put in it if we're put in a place where we're really struggling for field space if we come up with uh, one hour time blocks for games so um, so far you know that again would take significant planning um, and um, if it is 
if we are moving into a situation where we're clubs are, are really the majority are wanting to do full field um, we may need to find opportunities for those clubs that are not able to to field full field um, teams and try and figure out maybe weekends or days where we can actually uh, work out some type of scheduling block where we maybe do hour-long game blocks and so on so um, we're going to dig a little bit here into some more detail here. So this is the standard, you know, rule sheet for the season. Um, all the basics apply just as they did last year with no changes. Our option B is the one where we're looking at small sided rules for the season, um, potentially going seven V seven, you know, and this is one of those scenarios where if we were absolutely forced to go into this space, um, this is what we would potentially be looking at. Um, Laura, I noticed a, a note. Did you want to chime in? Uh, only if uh, you guys have questions about that. Um, you know, if, if there are okay. any. That's all. Okay. Yeah. What, are there any questions related to what what these two slides look like, and specifically your small sided questions or anything like that? Take a pause for that now. No? Okay. If you should happen to think of something and um, we're, we've moved on, feel free to put it in the chat too. We'll, we'll um, continue to monitor that. Yeah, I think the only thing would be that the, you know, the delegates wanted to push the vote on that item back to December. So that will be coming to the delegates you know, shortly the board meets on the 18th of this month and we'll send out that official notice for electronic vote. And that's where they'll get to chime in on if the league does small sided in order to meet COVID restrictions or uh, if we stay with the traditional format of the game. So. Great. Thank you. Yep. Okay. So this is, we've consolidated this just for our, the presentation tonight, but you know, the, the scheduling appendix is as follows. With respect to the dates we're looking at, we've got our blackout dates listed. Um, we'll have the the scheduling of appendix for the 2021 season published shortly, but this is a snapshot of it. Um, but we did include the the hour long block uh, option in there um, just in case, you know. And as Laura said, it will be voted on to see um, standard one hour across the board. Um, we have game times that are tied to that uh, as well. So. Um, the play days that are listed here, you know, we're breaking these out into regional regional options here. You'll see for the 14s and the 12s, uh, and then the the 10s and the 8s. Sounds like programs are interested in having uh, that type of play day if they're able to to do them based on um, you know their county restrictions. So um, we are currently scheduling those, and they are on the calendar. Uh, the season opens on Friday, February 26th. Um, but with that said, as you see the note, teams are not required to play opening weekend if you can't field your team. We understand that there are going to be uh, conflicting sports. We understand that you may have some players that are um, involved in another sport that picked up um, from the winter or from December. So uh, with that being said, you know we're not saying that everybody has to start playing games that opening weekend. Um, that's just when teams who have the uh, ability to do so can start playing. Um, otherwise, you know, you can pad that a little bit and give yourself some more time so that those winter sport players can um, finish their other sport and, and join you. Okay, our end of the season, you know, we're planning to, to have an end of season. Um, we are looking to focus on uh, regional base playoffs and flighted tournaments, as you can see here. Um, and then, you know, beyond the region, once we have uh, anointed regional champions, we'll look to do a league championship the following weekend to give teams the opportunity to play against those champions from the other regions. So um, here's kind of a snapshot of what that will look like. And again, this will be on the, uh, the scheduling appendix for the 2021 season. So um, one uh, new piece to note, which is, I think it's fantastic for those teams that, you know, th that are interested in this, but NCJLA end of season events are now US uh, lacrosse sanctioned events. So you can use this as criteria 
for qualifying for uh, national tournaments and rankings. So um, if you've got a team that that's a, a possible consideration, um, then CJLA can provide that help. So I think that's pretty exciting news for our, our organization. Chris, I did have, um, just want to point out one thing, and you might Thanks. be covering this. Uh, the How will they be ranked, those flighted tournaments? Um, for those of you that are kind of doing the math on how many teams are in your region and, you know, what would that look like? We're going to follow the A in high school uh, numbers for how to determine uh, the flights. And so if your region has more than 11 teams in that division, it'll be the top eight that will compete for that spot to go to the championship. And then if they have 11 or less, it will be the top four that will compete for the championship. And that, that's you. in the operations guide, if they're wanting to see that in writing. Okay, great. All right. Officials, so again, the <laughs> I think it's a monthly thing pretty much that you know we need without officials, we, we have no game. So um we do provide you with opportunities to grab some of these flyers and to use them uh, to promote uh, trying to find officials um, throughout your area and with your clubs. Uh, it's an important part that we can't stress enough. I know that there are, um, there are already stress points on you finding uh, volunteers for you know, different responsibilities within your organization, whether it's, you know, safety managers, uh, sideline managers, schedulers, you know, team parents, and we, we understand that. And, um, but we do want to make sure that even though that it is difficult that you are actively going out trying to find uh, new, new people to help become officials, because obviously without the officials, we, we can't proceed, we can't have games. So um, these are some flyers to help you uh, facilitate communicating with your, your parents and local communities um, to try and to find some new new officials, boys and girls. Okay, coaching certifications. So, um, remember you have to fill out your, your coaching uh, certification template spreadsheets and they're due to the NCJLA on these dates depending on which division the team is. Um, clubs may send their coaching registration template spreadsheet at any time. Uh, after team registration closes, uh, only NCJLA certified coach with a valid and visible coach's badge may stand with the team and coach during an NCJLA game. That's all still standard from last year. And you can have up to four coaches per team allowed on the sideline. Uh, for this year's coaching requirements, you know, we scaled down the requirements um, where you'll see here that one, you've got your US lacrosse membership, which is standard within the US lacrosse membership. Now you also have, which is included, uh, the cleared background check and the safe sport coaching certification. So right there, boom, there's three, three requirements already taken care of. Um, the last ones is uh, the signed code of conduct and the COVID waiver, which you know everybody's now, everybody now has the COVID waiver. Um, if you do not have a copy or template of that, make sure to notify us. I know that that is uh, something that we've provided uh, clubs so that you can go in and, and use. Um, we, we've, we have a template set up for you so that you don't have to try and create one from scratch. Um, and then the concussion certification, which is a statewide requirement. So um, after that, you, your certifications are complete. Uh, no late fee for coaches recruited after the deadline. So we know that uh, finding coaches is difficult, especially this year. Um, so, you know, we're absolutely sympathetic to that. And we want to give you the, the maximum amount of flexibility we can to try and find people and remove a lot of the obstacles that maybe existed in the past uh, to try and get some people to stick their toe in the water there. So. Okay. Um, for you know, 2021, there are no in-person clinics. Uh, so U.S. Lacrosse is not offering them this year in person. Uh, they will be providing some virtual coaching clinics, and uh, we've got discount codes available for those. If you're interested, um, you can use NCJLA Special Program Scholarship Form under the Club Admin tab. So um, just because we've reduced the coaching requirements for the season, 
Um, doesn't necessarily mean that you know we want uh, only the items for the certification and nothing else. You know, we we strongly encourage you and your your organization to go out and um, for those people that are interested to pursue other opportunities for training. So you know whether it's something with the American Red Cross, uh, up to us uh, sports. Um, U.S. Lacrosse itself, again, has a large variety of types of training, uh, specialty skills, specialties, things like that, um, that we recommend. You know, go ahead and take them. Sign up. Um, a lot of them are free. There are some paid, but apparently it's a, there's a minimal fee associated with it. Um, and from everything that I've heard, um, a, lot, a lot of those are actually really, really informative and good training sessions. So... And then um, we also have our RISE, the free web courses um, that cover everything from leadership, racism, identity, privilege, bias, empathy, and more. Uh, we really want to encourage organizations to kind of go outside of the box of just lacrosse training and start to really um, embrace other types of uh, courses on leadership, including the ones that we've identified um, uh, with RISE. So. Um, any other uh, follow-up questions that anybody has res with respect to our uh, our training this year, our coaches training? Nope. Okay. Okay. So at this time, I would like to introduce uh, uh, Dan. We have a, a partner here with NCJLA, and uh, he's with Max One. Um, like to uh, pass the uh, torch to Dan. I got a turn off this presentation and then uh, launch another, a new one. So if you can bear with me for a second. Hey, Dan, are you there? I'm here. Hey, Chris, thank you very much for uh, having me tonight. And uh, thank you, Laura and uh, the NCJLA uh, for having us and providing us this opportunity to speak with you uh, club directors today. And uh, I want to introduce to you uh, the Max One Virtual Coaching Platform. Uh, it's a web-based and mobile-based application, and it's the number one uh, virtual coaching platform in the market today. We were recently fully endorsed and partnered with uh, NBC Sports Engine, and <clears throat> that's kind of how we got in our conversations with the NCJLA and got invited here tonight. And uh, we're offering uh, free accounts for everybody in the NCJLA for uh, this virtual coaching platform. But I'd love to uh, share some more information uh, with you about that to see if this uh, really uh, piques your interest. So, um, Chris, can you please go to the next slide? Mm -hmm. So what we kind of do here, what a virtual coaching platform really is, uh, we can, we provide sports organizations a platform for you know coaches to create and assign customizable workouts to an athlete through uh, the Max One application. And, uh, you know, it's a very easy to use uh, uh, interface and it's, uh, you know, a great way to engage with our athletes for days that we're not meeting with them and, uh, you know, oh, and to heighten that engagement and get them off the couch, uh, you know, kind of during these days. And, you know, what's great about the application is not only uh, can we assign these uh, workouts and these drills to our athletes, but we can uh, track their activity with our performance leaderboards and we can kind of see, you know, their, their level of engagement and, you uh, <clears throat> What's also great is that we can customize these workouts and send them to, uh, they can make them as generic and send it to the entire team, or we can send it to an individual athlete. Maybe somebody was struggling on the face off dot, we can send them a quick uh, uh, drills to work on, or maybe it's a group of athletes. So, uh, you know, those uh, workouts that we create could be uh, specific towards the attack position or uh, to goalies, because those workouts will obviously be very different. So. Um, very customizable platform here, very easy to use. You don't need to be a, an Oracle engineer to figure it out, but uh, um, yeah, so it's uh, very nice. And uh, Chris, if you would please go to the next slide, that'd be greatly appreciated. And some of the issues, you know, uh, that we're kind of solving is, you know, within the season, you know, a lot of people are unsure if they're having games, uh, seasons, <clears throat> and uh, practices. So right now, you know, it's a great way to have that engagement and send kind of homework assignments uh, to athletes on off days, get them off the couch, get them uh, to put that Xbox down. And uh, it's also another area where a lot of coaches can coach the other coaches and, you know, uh, share feedback on games and learn new drills. So it would really provide a top down consistency for an organization. And, you know, it's a great uh, contingency plan, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, because of the weather outside today or, you know, uh, due to fac uh, facility or field closures um, that may may be happening in the uh, near future, as they have happened in the recent past. And uh, um, Chris, uh, if you can give that one more click, sorry about that. 
Uh, we're also doing, uh, you know, in the off season, we see this as a great way for athletes uh, and coaches to engage and uh, work on long-term workout programs and have that long-term uh, athlete development plan. And uh, also to ramp an athlete up into that next season or for the next season of tryouts. But what it really does for an organization, it keeps that athlete's engagement with the club all year long and uh, developing that club loyalty that we're looking for so we can reduce that athlete churn and, you know, increase that athlete retention rate that we're all kind of striving for. So, and, uh, you know, another thing, this is a great way to uh, start, you know, what organizations are doing is leveraging this virtual coaching platform and uh, to create new revenue streams for their organization. And I think that's a very exciting conversation. I think you uh, folks may all be interested in. So, uh, Chris, if you can go to the next slide, that'd be uh, greatly appreciated. So this is a, kind of just a quick still shot of the uh, virtual uh, coaching platform. We have the web based on the left and the mobile apps on the right. So uh, our, we would you know, have the ability to upload content into our training libraries, which are categorized into skill development, strength conditioning, education materials, and a coach's corner. And so after we upload that material, we can just drag and drop right into a nice, simple, uh, easy to use interface and then deliver these and assign these workouts to our athletes. So they'll receive it on their phone. They can click into the drill view that video real quick, understand what they need to do, understand how, how much of it, and maybe understand the sets and reps, record the results, and they'll be uh, tagged into that leaderboard so they can, you know, kind of see how they're competing against their teammates. And, uh, you know, it really adds a nice competitiveness and, a, and a, a gamification to the application. Um, Chris, if you could go to the next slide, that'd be great. And uh, one uh, success story I want to tell you guys about is uh, uh, a partnership that we have with Shoreline Lacrosse. They, uh, recently signed up and what we did for them was take our virtual coaching platform and um, created a custom app for them. So now it's the Shoreline Lacrosse powered by Max One. And, you know, they had roughly around 150 athletes and it's a very competitive uh, environment in Southeastern Connecticut. And they were really kind of looking for ways to raise athlete engagement and not only um, raise that engagement, but hold the athletes accountable. They wanted to know that they're actually doing these workouts that we're sending them. And, uh, you know, it's another way that they wanted to do was to grow their brand. It was, again, it was a very competitive area in that area. So it's a great way to separate, you know, from their competition to attract uh, top talent to enhance that club offering for their athletes and uh, parents. So uh, they have their you can look at that in the Apple store and uh, they're available in the Android store. So that's really a, a nice uh, success story that we've had on a, a regional club level. And then, uh, Chris, if you can go to the next uh, slide, that'd be great. And, uh, you know, we've also done uh, a work with uh, True Lacrosse, one of our partners, and they're able to deliver workouts to over 400 of their True uh, Lacrosse uh, teams nationwide. And, uh, you know, what, the, what they're really kind of doing, they put their application, you know, by building out their own application, they're in the phone of all of their athletes. And, you know, that, that goes uh, the same for just the virtual coaching platform itself. You know, we're putting athletes and coaches uh, connecting them. So, you know, at any place, any time. They can receive a workout and get that done on demand. And uh, it's really, a, you know, I think a very valuable tool for youth sports organizations. And, uh, you know, I just, uh, uh, Chris, if you can go to the next slide, yeah, that'd be great. And uh, I'd love to talk to any of you uh, and all of you uh, whenever you have some time uh, and kind of give you a full in-depth uh, demonstration of the VCP, learn a lot more about your organization and, you know, see how we can help you out. And uh, I think you'd be very impressed to see uh, the Max One virtual coaching platform in action. And, uh, you know, I just want to say thank you all for giving me about five minutes here to speak with you tonight. And I look forward to, uh, you know, hearing from you guys. And if you have any questions or concerns, please let me know. Additionally, we're, we can also do all uh, free accounts going to December 15th for all of these uh, clubs involved with the NCJLA. Uh, so uh, be more than happy to set you up with a temporary account just so you can give it a test drive. Great. And, uh, Thanks, that, that, that's, that's what I got, Chris. Thank you very much awesome. for the time. I really appreciate it. And thank you very much, Laura. I really, really thank you very much for the opportunity. Yeah, yeah I love this. It's a, as a former director, I think it's, it, I would have loved to have had this, you know, two or three years ago when training coaches and just, uh, you know, coaching multiple teams. So um, thanks for getting in touch with us. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I, I'm more than welcome to stay on and hang on if anybody has questions at the end of your entire uh, presentation, if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. And can you put uh, something in the chat uh, with how people can uh, reach you as well, just so they can make an easy copy from there? That'd be awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much, Chris. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Let's get back to where we were. Okay. So um, scheduling. Woohoo. Um, 
how to prepare for the scheduling meeting. Well, this year, while the fundamental components of how to prepare for the scheduling meeting are, are, are pretty standard, obviously there's going to be some changes in how things could potentially go this year. So, um, but you know, we want to get things on your radar to start to prepare. Uh, this year's scheduling meeting is uh, now later. It's happening in January as opposed to December to give it some more time there. Um, so other th things that you want to start to consider is um, renting home fields if you can. We know that that's a struggle. Um, understanding, if anything, where you are with field availability and um, you know, maybe you may have to reach out to neighboring clubs who have access to fields, things like that. So it's important to, to, to get that on your radar now, especially as you start to compete with other sports for field space. Um, you know, talk about how many games uh, to each of your team want to play home and away. Um, obviously, the focus is on regional play, so you can have those conversations, um, you know, locally. Um, try and figure out who's around you and, and how do you want to work a potential schedule with them. Um, we will be hosting the uh, online scheduling training here uh, soon. I believe it's next week. So um, is that right? Yeah, I think so. Um, we want to get that on your radar. Uh, the information is listed on the NCJLA calendar. So you, um, there are going to be three sessions, but you only have to attend one. So uh, they're offered, I believe, on is it. Is it a Friday, Saturday, Sunday? I believe, Laura. If I'm wrong, you can correct me on that. Uh, right. It's a uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I was one day off. Okay. <laughs> um, and then you want to uh, build, get your calendars started. Build your calendar or spreadsheet to help you keep track of your your club schedules, uh, so that everybody within your organization knows where things stand with your field space and who has what and when. Uh, yes, there we go. The schedule trainings are listed here. So we got the 19th in the evening. Um, we got the 20th uh, at noon, and then uh, the 21st will be in the morning at nine o'clock. The um, the online scheduling for A and high school is going to take place in January, but we haven't figured out exactly when that's going to be scheduled yet. So um, we will get to that as soon as we have that information. The uh, regional meetings, we've surveyed the programs and it looks like uh, either the 7th or the 8th, um, your directors will be, or your the NCGLA staff member overseeing kind of the region will help assist with getting that uh, planned out for you. We do not know at this time whether it will be virtual or in person. Uh, we, uh, the NCGLA staff is actively trying to um, review different software applications that uh, we could potentially use for a virtual scheduling meeting. So there are a couple things out there um, that we're taking a look at. You know, there are a lot of challenges associated with online scheduling. So, um, and we're fully aware of what a lot of those are. So in order for us to have a virtual scheduling meeting, you know, we're having to come up with a structure that makes uh, things as easy as possible. Um, there's no optimal perfect solution so uh, but we are definitely trying to vet out the different options that we have now um, should we need to go to a virtual training session um, and we're also looking at the uh, the league-wide scheduling training taking place or scheduling uh, taking place on January 9th again not sure if it's visual or virtual or um, in person uh, we're definitely you know in the midst of trying to figure that out um, we will say that uh, the league-wide scheduling is optional. You know, we, we want to make sure that, you know, we're, all, we're adhering to the, the, um, the restrictions in our um, local counties in terms of, you know, playing. Um, so we're very mindful of that. But for those programs that have the opportunity and can play outside of their region, uh, we want to make sure that we're doing what we can to try and accommodate that as well. So. More to come. Team registration. Uh, team registration is a little different this year in terms of how the fee structure is um, is laid out. You'll notice here that there's three different types of fees associated: the league fee, league listing fee, the operations fee, and the event fee. Um, you know, as you see here, uh, our only fee that is non-refundable is the league listing fee. So there's a lot of work that goes into setting up. 
uh, the league, all the documentation, all the structure, all the templates, all the work spent with, with that goes into the operation of it, and that goes toward that. We've got the operational fee as well here, which is due on the 17th of January. Um, this is refundable if the season is canceled. Um, and then the event fee itself has been uh, separated out, and this is entirely optional. So um, if you do want to be included in an, uh, uh, an end of season event fee, um, teams, you must opt in. So, and again, this fee is refundable if the event is canceled. So um, we do want to call out the fact that, you know, your typical tournament costs when you play, you know, anywhere are, are somewhere around a thousand plus per team. And that uh, the NCJLA is able to offer an end of season event that costs less than $500. So um, we do feel pretty good about the ability to keep those costs relatively low in comparison and give kids the opportunity to play uh, in an end of season event. So if we're able to. Any questions with respect to the registration and the fees? No? Okay. We'll keep moving on. Um, when you go to register your team, you know, we recommend, highly recommend the team strength score calculation worksheet, um, which, you know, you can access from the NCJLA website, um, especially this year, you know, this is a year unlike any other. And so trying to figure out which division your team belongs in will be a challenge. And um, the team strength, strength score calculation worksheet helps provide you with the framework of figuring out what type of team that you have based on the, the talent of your players. Um, if you ever find yourself in a situation where you're just, you feel like you're in the dark and you don't know, please reach out to me or any of the commissioners and we can help you figure out where you should be, whether it's because we understand the landscape of where other programs are uh, or, you know, through a conversation with you, we can figure out the what the composition of your team is and where you might best be suited. So we are here to help with that. We have a lot of people who are um, very well versed on understanding the um, the talent level of teams and and what division they should go into. So please, if you're if you're in the dark with this, please reach out for help. Um, otherwise, you know this is a great place to start with this uh, worksheet. Okay, so submitting age petitions, you know, one of the underlying themes throughout the entire process, whether we're dealing with scheduling, whether we're dealing with uniforms, uh, registration, whatever the case is, how do we get the kids to play? How do we get the kids on the field to play? And we want to try and eliminate as many obstacles as possible. So um, one thing that's going to be important when you're trying to compose your teams this year is having to deal with, you know, the, the realities of you might have to fill out some petitions to get kids to move around in different places. So, um, you know, petitions must be submitted via the NCGLA age petition form. You can do that at any time. Um, you can submit forms from now through the end of the season. Um, uh, petitions may be uh, submitted by the club president or a delegate, not by the parent or the coaches. You know, that's an important one. Uh, the NCGLA board will review submitted petitions bi-weekly this year and communicate shortly thereafter. So you no longer have to wait uh, a month to find out whether or not your petition has been accepted or, or be fortunate enough that the timing between when you submitted the petition and the, and the board meeting for review was a short period of time. So um, they've really improved upon, they've taken good steps to uh, improve the time frame, the turnaround for petitions to be reviewed. So, um, uh, and any, if you have a question regarding any type of petition, please reach out to Laura, our executive director at the uh, email address that are listed on your screen. Some common questions that we've had to field already is can a ninth grader play at the 14U if they're age eligible? Yes. Um, do ninth graders who are uh, 14U age eligible need to uh, fill out a liability waiver? Nope. Nope. Um, can a club register a grade pure team? Yes, they can. Again, as long as, you know, we're talking about teams being um, any anybody who's dealing with an age eligibility question needs to, to submit the petition. But yes, you can do that. Um, do seventh and eighth graders need to uh, fill out a liability waiver to play on a high school team? Yes, they do for safety reasons. So it's important to recognize the fact that 
you know, we, we want to give our seventh and eighth graders the opportunity to play at a level that they are, uh, you know, that they're appropriate to play in, uh, but we do want to make sure that we're doing it um, safely. So a liability waiver is required for those. Can a CIF player play for the NCJLA uh, where they are age eligible? Yes, they can. So our uh, rules this year have been um, modified slightly to be more accommodating to those players who are you know, kind of struggling with uh, trying to accommodate both the CIF program and the NCJLA. Um, further information is listed on our website about that, but if you find yourself in a situation where you have a player who also plays on a CIF team, um, there is an option for them to play on an NCJLA team, and there's some um, requirements about uh, whether or not they would qualify for an end-of-season event, So, um, but this is something that we're we're excited to, to be able to offer teams this year as well. So, and then can a high school senior play on a, in the JV division? Yes, they can uh, with a petition. So please um, get on that if you need, you know, you've got that, again, we, we've talked about if you have that senior who, um, you only got a couple seniors who are in the program, not enough to field a senior a level team, varsity level team, and um, JV's their option, please get that petition in. We wanna try and find a place for everybody. Here's more about the petition form here. So a couple of things to recognize that boys or girls team, a uh, team requested to play on, uh, the birth date, number of years, playing experience, the uh, position, the grade, and the height and weight, uh, and the reason for the request. These are all important factors for our uh, NCGLA board to consider when reviewing petitions. Because again, we wanna make sure safety is our top priority. We wanna make sure that we're uh, making responsible decisions. So. Okay, so uh, a couple things that just follow up on the monthly club uh, action item list that uh, our admins get. Um, you know, we've identified our safety manager training, which already took place on the 8th. We do have, we did record that and it is posted for you to review. Um, we've got, you know, some key dates associated with the, uh, the timing of um, the roster submission, coach certification, uh, home game schedule submission templates. Um, let's see. Um, uh, Laura, I don't know if you want to take a moment to um, discuss the state representative uh, alliance, uh, California Youth Sports Alliance letter. I think that's an important one to call out. Yeah, uh, thanks. The um, We sent our letter uh, back in October. Uh, the governor postponed their, you know, weekly update on Tuesday because of the election last week. Uh, this past Tuesday, uh, the governor's office uh, stated that they are working on something for youth sports and our feedback so far with our with the lobbyist that was um, you know hired by our alliance and the assembly members who are in support of it is that the county health departments are uh, looking at that guidance and they're reviewing what possibly could come down the pipe for us so you know, I know nobody wants to see the game modified. They don't want to play a different version. But the feedback that we are getting from these county health departments is that lacrosse is too dangerous. It's or not too dangerous. It's too risky with COVID. And so, um, and even some of the other sports in the alliance are being told that as well. And so our plan of action so far is that we are preparing modifications that our leagues or our games could do that wouldn't you know fundamentally change the game and it, it, it would be a completely different game so that's kind of why chris and if you were on a girls rep call yesterday they're proposing these modifications it's because the governor's office is pretty strict about what they're going to allow uh, we've also sent them information about you know travel teams traveling out of the state and how this is impacting you know, the local community because they are going, and I'll just be honest, in the governor's opinion, they're going to hot spots for COVID. So there's pressure from multiple sources, you know, even our health workers saying, you know, these kids, these families are traveling and they're coming back. We know this from contact tracing. So I guess to say all that is that if your club is able to, it would be helpful if you would contact your local representative. We have a lot of information on our homepage of our website that states, you know, um, some sample 
email that you could send. We also listed all the contact information for the county. Uh, you just click through that spreadsheet and there's links to those individuals. If you could just send some type of message on how you know coronavirus and these restrictions are affecting your children and your your ability to offer youth sports, that would be incredibly helpful. Um, I will say this isn't official yet, but the Youth Alliance is also looking at holding a rally at the state capitol. Uh, and just you know, this isn't to be disrespectful of you know, the restrictions that are in place, we want to be in support of that because we do want everyone to be safe. But we feel like as youth sports professionals and recreation professionals that we're, we are qualified enough to, you know, follow industry guidance or even the governor's guidance of how we can modify our operations to be safe. So um, with that, I'll pause. And if anybody has any questions about that, I'd love to answer to help support you. Okay. Well, the, the other question that was asked yesterday was, does our club need to have a safety manager right now? And the answer is no, because we're not, we're not, uh, we don't have any games going on. We don't have clubs going back and forth to one another. So if your club has not found a uh, safety manager, then, you know, that's okay. You, you know, you can wait till we actually start having um, some sense of a season before worrying about that. Great. And then could you, um, I know yesterday we, we spoke uh, real quickly about the NCGLA scholarships and grants and that um, we were, there's money still to be had. Did you want to take Yeah, that? yeah. We, we had a few um, applications come in. We have the original player scholarship where if your club um, does provide scholarship, you can apply for up to 50% of that to be reimbursed to your club. And then we have new team scholarships and we have special program scholarships. And both of those uh, cover, you know, either your team registration fee or it can cover, you know, new goalie equipment. We have that new standard that we have to follow now for um, goalie equipment or, you know, it can cover maybe increased field rental costs. So I encourage you to look at that page in the operations guide and uh, send in your applications because we have money to give away. Great, thank you. Okay, and then uh, the last uh, slide that we have here uh, to share is, um, you know, these are ongoing uh, items where, you know, if you need help with your uh, outreach events, you know, trying to figure out ways to drum up uh, excitement, new players, things like that, um, please, you know, uh, if you need help with that, please reach out to us. Uh, we have uh, we have things that you can um, distribute. Uh, we also have ideas and w different ways that you can drum up interest um, for your club and players in the area. Um, you know, age age eligibility petitions, we, we discussed that. Uh, play out of area form is now open. So if you're in a situation where, you know, you've got players that depending on what type of field you're, your field, or what, sorry, what type of teams you're fielding, um, and if there's a, a player that needs to play out of area because you don't offer the, the, the team and, you know, like an A division team or something like that, uh, that is now open. So be aware that you either may, uh, may be time to fill one out or you may receive one from another club. And then um, if you need help with coaching and we can do anything to help post those, uh, those want ads, um, let us know, you know, submit a coach or a club admin job uh, with the NCGLA and we will get that posted on the website for you. Um, and Laura, I believe you said we also post it with NorCal. If I'm not yeah, mistaken. so uh, <laughs> if, you, if you submit a job posting and you end up seeing it on other websites, uh, we are now posting to Indeed and we're posting on the NorCal chapter website. So um, the NCJLA is not hiring coaches. We are just posting on behalf of the clubs and any applications that we get we will forward to the club that submitted that uh, job request. Awesome. And then uh, the last item, um, we touched on uh, uniforms. Uh, again, the underlying goal is we do not want uniforms to be an obstacle in getting kids back on the field. So if, if you gotta go out on the field with pennies, that's fine. You know, we, we, we don't want that to be a problem. So if you have to submit a waiver form, that's all we ask. So 
you know, ordering uniforms this year is expected to be a challenge. And if you don't have the resources or if, you, you know, you don't have the capacity, you just, you need to come up with an alternative solution for uniforms this year. Hey, submit a waiver. We'll figure out what to do. We, that is not going to be something that is going to prevent your kids from playing lacrosse this year. So um, with that being said, uh, I want to thank everybody for your time. I'll open it up to any questions that you might have. I know um, Laura's probably got to be, I know you've got a, a meeting coming up here in a couple minutes. I don't know if anybody's got a quick question for Laura before she takes off. Anybody, any questions before we wrap things up for tonight? Um, well, I, well, I have a sort of general question. Marco from Berkeley Lacrosse. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Uh, I, oh, I'm just kind of wondering, like, I'm listening to all this, and we're over here planning. We're we're not even sure we're going to be able to play any games or any any, you know, certainly not travel to to another to out of region. Is sort of right. all of this that we discussed tonight? Is it sort of under the auspices that that things will change and we will be able to play the games or or what is NCLH's position on on how the season will look like if if we cannot play actual games of lacrosse? Laura, I don't know if you want to take it or I can. Yeah, sure. No. Um, this is every sport right now. Every sport sure. is having conversation um we specifically picked the you know season cancellation date of february 10th right because cif um their uh playoffs and some of their other championships from the fall sports will occur around that time and then we have the cif lacrosse season starting shortly thereafter so if CIF is not able to have games or other things happening, that'll be a key indicator to the NCGLA board that, hey, this is just not going to work. Um, the only downside with the way the season is uh, compressed and how all the other sports are playing at the same time as us, we do need to do some planning. And that's why we've pushed a lot of the dates back. I do want to emphasize to you guys that if, we end up canceling the season February 10th that the money, um, you know, for your season operations or event fee will come back to you guys. And right. it's, uh, you know, it, there's just so much work to be done that it would be unfair to you guys and to, you know, our officials and, you know, the field operators to not plan and then suddenly like bombard them with everything that we need. To right. Get sure. So, sure. um, and it's totally fine for your club to be like, Hey, we're, we're going to register our teams late. <laughs> like we're not going to register right. them in December. Um, you know, cause right. every club is different. And I know you guys are in what Alameda County. Uh, we are in, yes, Alameda County. Yeah. Alameda County is one of the more, um, you know, stricter counties at this time. Yeah. So it's right. totally fine for you guys to be in like a holding pattern right now. Right. Which, you know, which is, that's weird. I guess that's why I was, you know, listening to this meeting, I'm just wondering, like, again, this is all under the auspices that we are going to actually be able to play, right? This isn't assuming that we're going to get to play, right? Right. Do you understand, like, making that distinction, right? Right. Well, right. the okay. reason why we're more hopeful is because of the governor's office and the assemblymen that are working with us. They're saying, mm -hmm. this is coming. It's just not going to be when you want it to come. So we're okay. hopeful because we are a spring sport you know, we're in that March time frame that right. it'll help us more than it's going to help, you know, say Pop Warner football or uh, rugby or field hockey. Right, right. Um, right. Um, and I guess, you know, there's this uh, another question I had, and maybe this is, you know, just for a more of a general audience is, you know, we're, we were having a hard time wondering how we're going to have our kids wear helmets and masks at the mm. same time. Right. So. I don't know if there's, if there's been any feedback on that or any, any conversations about that, but I'd love to hear some 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 other people's ideas about how that's going to work. Sure. The governor's office said that, um, you know, we're not required to wear a mask, but if we right. opted to, that would help our our cause. So right. I'll let the other clubs chime in, but that was their feedback to us. Right. Yeah. Hey, Laura, can I offer can I offer a suggestion? This is Matt yeah, sure. from the Grizzlies. Um, if we're we're kind of planning on if the nuclear option happens and mm -hmm. the entire spring season is essentially canceled like like last year 
Um, depending on your town, for example, in Menlo Park and Palo Alto, we've been able to run a fall ball program uh, with, with no contact. Essentially, it's a lot of stick drills and three on twos and four on threes and no contact and a lot of shooting drills and whatnot. Um, if it turns out down the road that um, we're not able to have a season, um, we're, we're planning on having a, a program similar to our fall ball where kids can, you know, get out and play. We're not able to scrimmage. We're not able to, you know, play games. But if it comes to it, kids still need to get, <laughs> kids still need to get outside. I mean, if we're right. still doing online school and we're not able to play games or, or you know, do anything kind of normal we're we're planning on having like a two to three two to three times a week similar to what we did for fall ball as long as um our town continues to allow it we've had to do a lot of paperwork and demonstrate that you know we're, we're able to play lacrosse a version of lacrosse without uh contact so kids are getting out and running around and having exercise and you know have a stick in their hand and whatnot as long as our town continues to allow that, and they have allowed that since June 2nd, um, then we're we're going to play lacrosse. We're going to play some, you know, version of lacrosse. Hopefully it won't come to that, but, um, you know, if the season is canceled, I, I would encourage you to, you know, try to work with your town to find some way to get your kids out there so we're not, you know, so everyone's not stuck at home like last spring. Right, right. Well, we did do that. We, we did have a fall ball you know, session where we, it was just all just drills and, and, and running and, and stuff like that, positioning and everything. So uh, we certainly were prepared for that. You know, we were just, you know, kind of wondering what other people were thinking about if we could have a season and if wearing a mask was, was part of that, like encouraged was, you know, was able to help that a lot bit how they were going to navigate a mask and a helmet because we, we tried it just to see what it would work. And it was a, it was a total disaster. So just yeah. Wondering. Yeah. Right. Okay. Any other any other questions regarding any other topic we hit on tonight? Uh, I just wanted to say that the were you guys using a mask that was like a cloth one that was underneath of the helmet, or were you doing that clear face shield that attaches to the helmet? We 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 tried everything. We had you know oh, okay. the cloth one, and then you know we had the one that goes over the ears, behind the head. We even tried to put it like over the helmet. We did get some of those those glass ones, the you know the the um the like the ones you're talking about, the, like like the hockey. Yeah, we tried those, and um you know those certainly worked, but we didn't know if those met. You know if they're I mean you're still there's stuff you know particles yeah, are still no, they, flying they, out right yeah. According to the governor's office in these meetings, that meets the requirement. That's one of the reasons why lacrosse is kind of like gets all the questions because our equipment is can you you know we can modify right. it so and we don't have you know like uh, tackle football so it's uh right. it's, it's a little bit easier so it, if you could shoot me a message offline about your the kids feedback on that or even the coaches how they felt about it that'd be okay. really helpful all right sure about the the clear plastic ones yep mm -hmm. yeah yeah okay so so what you're telling me right now is like our so our county line guidelines say you must wear masks when feasible so yeah what right so what you're telling me is that those clear shields meets that mandate yes mm -hmm. okay great okay that's good news good deal any more questions okay. and we still have dan dan's uh, available too if you had any uh specific questions for max one as well so Okay. Well, and I guess then that will be a wrap. So, hey, everybody, thank you so much again for joining me tonight. You guys are rock stars. Um, this recording will be uh, posted on uh, the boys link and it'll be on our YouTube. The video will be on our YouTube channel here within probably the next 48 hours, uh, as well as the deck itself uh, with active links. So um, with that being said, thank you, everybody, and have a good night. Cool. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Thank you.